please welcome to the stage, Christine Holt! Hey guys, how's it going? I didn't know I could take notes, so... <laughs> all up here. Um, all right. So, uh, I'm gonna tell you about the greatest night of my life. But first, you have to know a couple things. And uh, these things are that I have uh, some long-term love, things that I love in my life. I don't know how else to describe it, but one of those things is my love for this city. I love New York. And one of the things I think is so great about it is that you never know what's gonna happen here. You know, I, I went to a, a workshop show once and I ended up hanging out in Spalding Gray's apartment having bourbon. It was so fucking cool. I have sang time after time with modern day geisha girls in a Japanese karaoke club that I could not find again if my life depended on it. <laughs> I've also watched a lot of Netflix. So, you know, part of New York is you have to be up, you know, to accept the challenge. Another great love of my life is Alan Cumming. I fucking love Alan Cumming so much. I first saw him in 1998 uh, in Cabaret, and that performance blew my mind. He was so charismatic on stage. He was so sexy and weird and, I don't know, scary and hot, and it was like the first time that I thought androgyny might be something I was interested in. I mean, my, whole, my, my, my love for him is not really sexual. I mean, I mean, I would have sex with him, but <laughs> it's more like, I just want to give him some eyeliner and a pair of my panties and like, you know, see what happens. <laughs> so 2006, my friend Randy calls me out of the blue and she says, hey, I've got tickets to Broadway Bears. Do you want to come tonight? Broadway Bears is a charity event they do every year. Um, all the Broadway kids get together and do a show and um, they raise money for Equity Fights AIDS. And that year, Alan Cumming was performing with Cyndi Lauper in Three Penny Opera. And he was hosting that show. So of course, I totally wanted to go. So we went and it was really fun and cool. And at the end of the, end of the show, it's like there's a runway and a stage. All the, you know, all the Broadway dancers come out and true to the you know, name of the show, they are barely wearing anything. And they come to the edges of the stage and they encourage you to like, tip them like strippers. So I'm there, I'm like, you know, doing my part for the cause. And I look up and Alan is walking down the runway. And it hadn't occurred to me that he would actually come down to the edge of the stage. And I look down and I don't have any more singles or even fives, I've, I've already shoved them places. And I don't know what to do. And I look at Randy and she says, just give him a 20. And I knew she was right. Like I could not put a price tag on a dream. <laughs> so. I held up a, a $20 bill straight up in the air and I said, Alan! And we made eye contact and I folded it long ways and I put it in my mouth and I went right up to the edge of the stage and I just waited. He got about five feet from me and he stopped. Something, I don't know, something went through his mind and then he got down on all fours and he crawled over to me and he took that $20 bill out of my mouth with his mouth, and he was right next to me. And I don't know where that $20 bill had been. It was so gross, but it was so good. And then he stood up, and I was so excited. I was like doing a little dance. And I turned around, and I bumped into my friend Kevin, who was also at the show. And uh, we started chatting, and um, I introduced him to Randy. Uh, side note, Kevin is a boob man. And Randy has a really big personality. <laughs> so we're talking, and he leans over at one point and says, um, is your friend single? And I said, yeah. She was single, but you know, I, I can't make promises with someone else's pussy. So <laughs> Kevin knows, of course, I love Alan, and he, he says, you know, I'm friends with Alan's driver. I could just see if they're going out maybe after the show, and then we could all go and hang out. And I was like, oh my God. I turned to Randy and I was like, can we please go do that? Like if that happens? And she said, yeah. And I was like, I'll, I'll get the first round. I'll buy the first round. She said, yeah, sure. So we get to the intel. We head down to the Lower East Side. We're in a club, uh, like a, you know, just a dirty bar. There's a back room, um, pretty small. There's a very tiny stage where you could dance. And there's like tables and, 
Alan Cummings there with Cindy Lauper and a couple other people sitting at a table, and Kevin and Randy are sitting on the other side of the room, and after about 30 minutes, Alan gets up and goes to the dance floor. So I was like, all right, this is my shot. I'm gonna go talk to him. <laughs> so very coolly, I'm sure, I walk over, <laughs> And I said, hey, I don't know if you remember me, but earlier you uh, crawled over and took $20 out of my mouth. And he said, oh yeah, yeah, I do remember you. I, I remember thinking, should I get the $20 with my butt cheeks or with my mouth? <laughs> and I said, well, I appreciate the FaceTime. Um, and then we talked about like his dogs and he lives in the East Village and blah, blah. I honestly don't know. I was just like so excited to be like talking to him. And after about 20 minutes, I, I could feel that our window was closing. You know, like he, he had shined his light on me and now he was done. And I, I started to panic because I thought I haven't told him how much I love him. And I know it's really cliche when you meet someone to be like, I really love your work. But at the same time, I think it's really important to let people know that they've touched you and that what they're doing matters. So I just blurted out, I said, I really loved you in that show that I cannot remember the name of right now, but you were so good. And he said, Cabaret. And I said, yeah, that's, that's the one. And he said, thank you. And I was like, no problem. <sighs> Come on. So I go over and Randy's like, you know, stirring an empty, you know, cup of ice. And I was like, oh God, how are you? Are you interested in Kevin at all? And she said, no. And I was like, great. No one's, no one's winning tonight. <laughs> and uh, speak of the devil, Kevin pops up. And he says, guys, uh, I just talked to the driver and they are going to move to another club. And if we want to go with them, we could ride in the car. We could ride in the car? I turned to Randy, I was like, can, can we please just go? Like, I'll get the first round, like, come on. She's like, yeah, it's fine, let's go. So we go out, and it is one of those big, black, like, Escalade type things with like dark windows, the kind of car that when it drives by, you wonder what is happening inside of that car. Well, I'll tell you what was happening inside of this car. The driver and Alan were sitting in the front. They were talking to each other. Then it was Cindy and this guy Rico. And then it was me and Randy and Kevin was in the back where you keep like a spare tire. <laughs> <laughs> and every time we turned a corner, Kevin would like roll around and Rico kept trying to reach over the seats because he was trying to give some cocaine to Kevin because Rico wanted to have sex with Kevin. But Kevin wanted to have sex with Randy and Randy was just there for the drinks. <laughs> but I was in a car with Alan Cumming. So we pull over, we get into the West Village. Everybody piles out of the car. I help Cindy Lauper out of the car, who, by the way, is the tiniest person I have ever met. <laughs> she was wearing these huge heels, and she was still shorter than me. And so I put my arm around her waist, because she was having a hard time with these shoes that were on wet cobblestone. And so I kind of lifted her up a little bit, so her little feet were just like hovering above. <laughs> you know, continuing our conversation from the car. And we're talking about, you know, being actors and, and theater and the show she was in and what she thought about the director. And she was really talking to me like I was another artist. And yes, she was completely wasted, but it felt <laughs> sincere. <laughs> so we get to the club and the, Alan, you know, meets the guy, at the, the guy at the door and he says, oh, you know, they're with me. I was with Alan. <laughs> and we head down and it's a, it's a gay dance club and it, it goes down into the basement, and even before you get down there, like smoke is coming up, and the music's pounding. And you can see like red flashing lights, and as we get down to the bottom of the stairwell, people turn to see who's coming in, and it's Alan. So the crowd just parts like the Red Sea. <laughs> we walk in, I put Cindy down. <laughs> Head over to the bar, I'm about to order a drink. I look over, and Alan is standing right next to me. So I ordered the drink and I looked back up and suddenly he was just eating a lollipop. And I said, oh my God, how, where did you get that? That was totally like magic. And out of thin air, or maybe his pocket, he pulled out another lollipop and he gave it to me. I ripped that lollipop wrapper off, I shoved it in my mouth and I looked right in his eyes. And I felt a tap tap on my shoulder. There's another tap tap. Tap, tap. Finally, I turn around. It's Randy. She's like, we, we got to go. I said, um, I'm sorry? And he's like, we got we to go. I'm like, I'm really drunk. And I said, are you fucking kidding me? This is the greatest night of my life. Like, pull it together. 
And she said, I, just, I feel like I might be sick. Fuck, I don't want to leave. But I'm old school. And in that situation, this means that I have to take Randy home. So I hold her hand, I take a deep breath, I have a moment of mourning for the, the moment I had with Alan and what it could have been and now what it will never be. And I turned around to say goodnight, and he was already gone. I could just see the back of him as he disappeared into the sea of throbbing men. Alan had gone back home to his people. <laughs> The next day I woke up and I thought, oh my God, was that a dream? And I looked over in my nightstand and there was the gnarled lollipop stick. And I knew that it had been true. But then I thought, I was like obsessed, like what did I miss? You know, we, we left so early, did they go to another club? Maybe they ended up at someone's house and watched the sunrise from the roof or maybe everybody took their clothes off? Cause that happens. <laughs> so I called Kevin and I said, what happened after we left? Tell me everything in minute detail. And he said, mm, nothing really happened because they had dropped some E at the first place we were at, and then there was something in it, so when it hit them, they basically all started puking at the same time. So I would say about 20 minutes later, we just took them home. They also went home. Yes! <laughs> I didn't miss anything. The greatest night of my life was the greatest it was ever gonna get. <laughs>